Hi, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, these things, lithium-ion batteries. Now, I suppose we don't really think things through, I certainly don't, and didn't really think this one through until somebody wrote to me and pointed it out to me. Now, there are five main chemistries when it comes to lithium batteries. That's uh, lithium manganese dioxide, lithium ion phosphate, uh, lithium cobalt oxide, and then the weird ones like uh, lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, uh, lithium nickel cobalt aluminium oxide. So there's basically five of them. Incidentally, lithium polymer batteries use the same chemistry, they just use a polymer electrolyte. So five main chemistries. Now, the um, problem with some of this stuff is the cobalt used on it. Now, this is the thing I didn't really think about. Whenever I think about lithium, I, I think about the copper, the uh, aluminium, the graphite and the lithium used in it. Uh, and there's been some stories about how we're all going to run out of lithium. I don't necessarily think of the other things, but it turns out that most battery chemistries uh, use cobalt. Now, cobalt accounts apparently for something like 30-40% of the um, mass of a lithium battery. Now, I'm not 100% sure of these figures. I read them a while ago, and it's probably worth looking it up. But there's a significant amount of cobalt in all of these battery chemistries, apart from the lithium ion phosphate and the uh, lithium manganese dioxide type. Now, the energy density of lithium runs from something like 100, uh, sorry, the specific energy, it runs from something like 100 uh, watt-hours per kilo to 250 watt-hours per kilo. The unfortunate thing is that the manganese dioxide and the uh, iron phosphate are at the lower end. They have a lower energy density, only around 100 watt-hours per kilo, something like that. Lithium iron phosphate needs about 60 degrees centigrade to run, incidentally. So, the most widespread lithium battery is a lithium cobalt oxide. It accounts for most of battery production because it's the most stable with the best energy density. But it contains about 40% of cobalt in it. Now, the thing about cobalt isn't so much the material itself, which is obviously not very nice, but then there's lots of not very nice things inside a lithium battery. The thing about it is the way that it's mined. Now, apparently the bulk of cobalt comes from... Um, where was it? I think it's the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I think. But it's what's called a um, conflict mineral. That is, the where they actually mine this and the countries they mine it in are, are um, well, shocking is a, is a good way of describing it, and it is probably worth a, a look on it to see how they actually mine it. Is they mine it with um, children. They send children down holes in the ground to scratch this stuff out by hand. Now, I'm, I'm kind of not exaggerating from the reports that I've read. And I was reading a report of a guy who said, uh, oh yeah, cobalt, oh it's a shocker. Every now and then it rises its head, people tut tut and nobody does anything about it. And this is so much the story with the things that we do, and it seems a real shame somehow, is that an awful lot of what we do, we don't really consider the chain. Uh, actually, I'm being unfair, that's not quite true of course, because there are things where we have made changes in what we're doing. Um, for instance, Apple and Foxconn. Now, everybody knew how horrendous the working conditions at Foxconn were, and then because of consumer pressure, Apple had to do a guarantee of supply chain to say that it responsibly sourced its bits and pieces to make its iPhone. Marks and Spencers did the same thing on clothes. So if there's sufficient consumer pressure, then we will actually do something about this and make a difference to the, the way that we source what it is we um, use in our comfortable lives, because our lives are really comfortable. Now, we can go down to the shop, and here I'm talking about places like Australia, Canada, America, um, the UK, Europe, what we term the first world. We can go down to the shop and have the expectation of coming home with a loaf of bread. We don't have to worry about being shot in the street. Now, that's not true of everywhere in the world. It's true of a relatively select portion of the world in which people like me had um, the lottery to uh, draw a good lot in the lottery of life in being born in a country like this where I can have that expectation. But that means I equally don't worry too much about what's in here on the whole. As long as my drone can fly a good 20 minutes then I tend not to worry about it. Now obviously that is a viewpoint that is changing dramatically really. People are worrying about where this sort of stuff comes from. Um, how we get it and what we do with it at the end of its life. And to my mind, that's a very 
responsible and um, excellent approach to the world. As I say, I don't think you can make a massive difference to the world. I don't think as an individual you can do a huge amount of things. But I think as an individual you can do a small amount of things that will lift up the world a little bit. And if we all did that, then life would just be so much better for everybody concerned. And, and that's, I think, the mission we should be on, is to, is to do that little bit that was within our capability of doing. And buying things that are irresponsibly sourced or located or made with hideous conditions, I think, is part of our duty of care to the rest of the world. So when we look at these kind of things, then looking at the chain of supply, which, as I say, never really occurred to me until somebody sent me a note on it saying, hey, have a look at this. The, the way they source the cobalt for this stuff is just horrendous. It also gives me a great sense of pride in what we're doing, because we're doing this stuff, which is just painted pepper. What's in there is paper and carbon, uh, and they're non-scarce resources anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world can make a roll of paper and paint it with a carbon ink. Now, these things have the energy density of um, top-end lead acid, so we're talking about uh, 40 watt-hours per kilo, and that's just the paper and carbon version. Remember, it's our phase one, paper and carbon. Uh, and it doesn't sound so uh, amazing, I suppose, until you consider that the bottom end of these things is 100 watt-hours per kilo. So already, just using paper and carbon, we can get a battery that will perform only half as well as this. Now, we obviously have done different phases of this, and we've got batteries that perform better than this thing. Um, this thing performing at 100 to 125, incidentally, 125 is where lithium cobalt oxide sits, is only about three times better than lead acid. It, it's ridiculous, really, that we put so much effort into something that actually doesn't perform that well and causes a great deal of misery both in terms of its source of supply and, and what we do with it when we get rid of it. We, we don't actually do that much with it when we get rid of it. Then you can compare that to the sort of stuff that we're working on which is this paper-based device made out of paper and carbon that at the end of the life you can throw away and have no worries about. Now, as I say, that gives me a great deal of pride in what it is that we're doing here at FWG because I have this firm belief now that what we're doing, I think, is changing the world and changing the world for the better. And, and I'm proud of that and I'm proud of the people I'm working with to be able to do something like that. Anyways, just a few thoughts on lithium and cobalt mining and, and what I thought about it and to thank the guy who sent me the link and made me aware of this as an issue. And I hope it's of interest to you too. And thank you very much for watching.